Thanks. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Darius Kazemi. I'm, uh, uh, I call myself an internet artist, uh, and I'm known on the, on the web as Tiny Subversions. Uh, Twitter is kind of my second home, so feel free to look me up there. And uh, you can also check out all my projects on my website. Um, I flew in from Portland, Oregon on the west coast of the United States, uh, and I'm really happy to be here talking to you and drinking your awesome coffee and eating all the bacalao. Um, so I'm here actually to talk to you today. I was going to talk about side projects, but uh, uh, it this sort of morphed over time as I uh, watched people talk yesterday. And I think I actually want to talk to you about mirrors today, uh, kind of appropriately enough. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the kind of work that I do. Um, so I make bots, uh, not physical robots. I make software bots. Uh, does anybody here have any experience with bots? Uh, OK, a few hands up. That's cool. Um, I like to define bots as uh, computers communicating with humans via mediums designed for human-to-human -human communication. Um, so that could be Twitter, social media, IRC, the telephone. Um, most of my bots live on Twitter, uh, but some live on Tumblr. I've done Snapchat bots, Slack bots, uh, and bots for a few other platforms that you've probably never heard of. Uh, the bots that I make range from amusing to useful. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few of them just so you get an understanding of the kind of stuff that I do before I go into my talk. Um, Two Headlines is one of my more popular bots, and it's a Twitter bot that takes uh, headlines from Google News and swaps the subjects around, uh, resulting in things like Donald Trump joins the cast of Game of Thrones. Uh, five things you should know about San Francisco as a service. And ominously, uh, humans to restart by May 15th. Um, this is an example of a kind of bot that I build where I'm just looking at what people do on the internet and I'm finding underlying patterns in what they do. This is a kind of joke that humans like to tell where they mix up what's happening in the news. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, I can automate that. I can find the underlying algorithm and simply generate these. So this bot generates one of these every hour. Uh, and it's actually, I think it's funnier than most people who try their hand at this kind of joke. Um, I also have more visual bots. Uh, this one is called uh, Glitch Logos. Uh, it takes vector images of recognizable corporate brands and it morphs them into something recognizable but wrong and uh, sometimes a little disturbing. Uh, I want to see if I can open up the timeline for this. Yeah, so there's, there's Co Coca-Cola, clearly, uh, a few other brands on here. That's Chipotle. That looks really, here's McDonald's. All right. Um, so that's Glitch Logos. Um, and then uh, my most recent project is called uh, This Summer Bot. Uh, it's a collaboration with the California-based video artist uh, Duncan Robson. Uh, Duncan manually clipped about 2,000 title cards from real movie trailers. And I worked with him to write some software that remixes those clips into new teaser trailers. I think the best way to describe it is just to show you the output. So I'm going to click through and open up some of these. Hopefully we'll hear the audio. I'm going to turn my audio up. Uh, here we go. Hate isn't as crazy as you think, but first he'll have to reinvent himself. Uh, a banker and a desperate mother are not chosen. This October, they won't take it. Uh, a promoted tweet. Uh, to find a killer, the first hero has no color. This holiday season, get ready to rock at the end of the world. Um, and, and this again kind of followed that pattern. I, was, I saw Duncan was making these manually himself and I reached out and we thought we could work together to automate the process. So again, if you follow this summer bot on Twitter, you'll get uh, one of those every hour. Um, and keep the sound on because we found some good music to overlay. Um, these bots are part of my personal art practice, but I also work on this kind of stuff professionally. Uh, last year, I co-founded Field Train with my spouse, Courtney Stanton. 
Uh, we're a creative technology cooperative based in Portland, Oregon in the US. And you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, oh, oops, sorry. Let's go back here. There we go. That's Field Train. Um, you can follow us on Twitter uh, or you know, check out our website. Uh, we're structured different, differently from your typical studio. Uh, we're based on a few principles that we think are common sense but might be seen as radical in the tech space. Um, for starters, uh, Field Train can't be bigger than eight employees. Uh, we just don't think that uh, a big company is for us, but we've seen over and over again uh, people that we know start something, say it's going to stay, stay small, and then they see success, and of course they want to grow and build from that. And then once they're 20, 30 people, they're complaining uh, over beers about how it doesn't sound, it doesn't feel like it did back in the early days. Uh, so we just wanted to put a cap on this. Um, it's a worker-owned cooperative, so the basic idea is that if you work at Field Train, you're an equal partner in the company. Um, and uh, we do only interesting work that we believe in. We turn down work that we think is boring or not morally acceptable. Um, and we don't believe in billable hours because we don't think you can quantify creative work. Um, I'm not about to, uh, like, am I supposed to bill a client for the fact that I dreamt and the dream had the solution to a problem that I did? Like, am I gonna bill eight hours because that's how long I slept? Or I spent two weeks in the dream getting chased by a lion, so do I bill them for two weeks? And do I add extra compensation because I was distressed because the lion was chasing me? You know. Um, uh, so creative work is, is, is weird, uh, and, uh, and we don't think it's possible to, to fairly bill it um, like that. So we bill for time and attention, you know, if you work with us. You know, you're, work, you're getting our, uh, our undivided attention on your project for a number of weeks. Um, one kind of project we've done as Field Train is bot work that's uh, somewhat similar to the stuff I mentioned earlier. Um, Stay Woke Bot is something we made with Dre McKesson, who's a uh, black activist who fights police brutality in the United States. Uh, he spends a lot of time on Twitter, uh, and we helped him build a bot that automates some of the manual work that he and his collaborators have to do. Uh, Stay Woke does a lot of different things, including uh, managing harassment that he uh, and his team receive on Twitter. Uh, but um, what I'm showing here is an example where uh, a user can tell the bot where they live, and it gives them information on how to contact their local politicians uh, to ask for better gun control laws, uh, for example. Uh, and this stuff is primarily designed by the activists, uh, and, and we're kind of sitting there and implementing and then providing um, a little bit of extra feedback because we understand the mechanics of Twitter pretty well. Um, here's a corporate client that we had, um, Wizards of the Coast. They're the people who make Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, they wanted us to help them promote a new campaign setting for their game. And we ended up writing a bot that takes over their official Twitter account. Uh, when anyone retweets a certain promotional tweet, the bot generates a custom character for that person. Um, I'm going to open up. It's still live right now, so I can actually go to their page. This is their official Twitter account. And you can see here that people have been, it's been replying to people every now and then. Um, Braids streaming back, the speculative jabber is nobility and must set an example for every dwarf. Uh, although her kind and mine be enemies, Juvie the trustworthy makes a worthy ally in our conquest. And then when night falls, the wind whispers the name of Rural, the long-haired rogue. Um, uh, so we actually were given 200 portraits by the Dungeons and Dragons artists and we went through and uh, semantically tagged these pictures with different things. So we know that this picture has long hair and we know that she looks kind of sneaky so she gets a long haired and sneaky template and, uh, uh, and we build out language generators that are based on these features. And then the bot just sits there and creates these for people. Uh, so it's like a way for people to get some custom content and be engaged uh, on Twitter. And I'll show one more project that we did. Um, Uh, so this one is called Shortcut, and I'm just going to show it to you live up here. We did this with the uh, American radio program, uh, This American Life, um, and it was a uh, Mozilla Knight founded, uh, funded uh, grant project along with a grant from the Tau, uh, the Tau 
Research Center uh, at the Columbia School of Journalism. Uh, and the way that this works is it's a tool for sharing audio from podcasts. Um, so, for example, I want to share something that I heard on this episode with my friend so I can go to the transcript for the episode uh, and then select something like... Totally eye-opening. Because I have never been into that feeling at all. To me, the heat of summer is just something you had to get through. It was like rain, but less wet. Uh, so, okay, I want to share that with a friend, and so I can hit the, the preview button here. And then what that's doing is it's uh, rendering um, an MP4 uh, that you can then, uh, you know, you can connect to your Twitter account and, um, uh, and tweet it. You can connect to Facebook and post it on Facebook. Or you can just download it and do whatever you want. Uh, with the with the clip, uh, here it comes. It's coming in. I'm on a, I'm on a slower internet connection here, so hopefully this comes through. Uh, well, imagine a video on the left hand side there. This is the danger of doing uh, uh, a live demo here. Um, but yeah, the idea is you can share and post this stuff to Twitter um, and other social networks. Um, and so this was, uh, this was another project that we did. We don't always do bots. Sometimes we do applications, and we work with a pretty big, not a pretty big team. We worked with a team of about six people uh, on this project, including us. Um, going back to here. Um, so mirrors. I promised I was going to talk about mirrors. I'm sure you're all really excited to hear about them. Um, I was really impressed on the first day of MiraConf when they asked everyone, okay, who's a designer and who's a developer? And the room was split 50-50. Uh, about half of you raised your hands at the designer part and half of you raised your hands at the developer part. I think this is incredibly appropriate given the name of the conference. Um, I see designers and developers as kind of opposing sides of a mirror. Uh, both groups are doing what looks like opposite work, yet we're really 100% dependent on each other. Everything a developer does, there's an equivalent thing that a designer does. And for every action a designer takes, a developer has to react to it. It actually makes me think of that beautiful dance that the conference opened with yesterday morning. We're constantly circling one another, reacting to one another, and the best team members can insert themselves into the perspective of another person. If you ask me whether I'm a designer or a developer, I'd probably say I'm a little bit of a designer and a lot of a developer. Uh, I bet a lot of you are some combination of both, but you might feel pressured to identify one way or the other. I didn't see a whole lot of hands that were up for both designer and developer. But I also think the designer-developer divide is a little bit of a false dichotomy. I think every designer is a developer and every developer is a designer. Um, open this up here. I want to tell you a little bit about um, code and design. Uh, this is uh, a little demo based on something that I, a project that I did maybe three or four years ago. And this was a project, it was really small, I did it over lunchtime, and it really helped me understand the line between code and design and how they're, that's much blurrier than we really think it is. Um, so, if I asked you, if I asked a developer in this room to write me some code that grabs a random dictionary word and uh, gets its definition, uh, you'd probably say, well, okay, there's a dictionary API up out there and I can make a call and grab a random word and then I can make a call and grab its, its definition and that's not too hard to do. So here we have earthquake, a sudden and violent shaking of the ground. Um, Wonderland, a marvelous imaginary realm, aviation, the operation of aircraft, and so on and so forth. I can just generate a bunch more of these. Uh, if I asked a developer in here to write me something that generates jokes, you would probably say, well, that's not a very quick thing. That's kind of difficult technically to do. Um, but I, this is actually already is a joke generator, at least technically. All I have to do is add a little bit of context to it, and now, girl, you must be a musketry because you are the technique of using small arms. Uh, girl, you must be a dealings because you are a plural form of dealing. 
Girl, you must be a complainant because you are law, a party that makes a complaint or files a formal charge, as in a court of law, a plaintiff. Um, so this is technically the same thing that I was showing you before. It just has an image added to it and maybe seven extra words uh, on top of it. Um, so you know, there's, there's what the developer does here for this little demo. Um, I'm using the WordNIC API, which is a sort of meta dictionary for the internet. Great API if you haven't used it. Um, and I'm saying, okay, give me a random word. Uh, it's going to be a certain, you know, it has to be a fairly common word. It has to have a dictionary definition. It has to be in at least five dictionaries. It has to be a noun, and it can't be someone's name or their last name or that kind of thing. It has to be a, just, a, just a thing. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. These are technical choices, but they're also design decisions. Uh, if I, as the developer, decided to up the minimum corpus count there from 5,000 to 500,000, uh, what that means, or excuse me, reduce it from 5,000 to say 1,000, um, that would give me more rare words. And suddenly I'd start to get all these medical and technical terms that might be sort of funny, but are actually just confusing. It was actually, um, uh, you really had to I really had to tweak that to make sure that it was just landing at an appropriate level of familiarity for the joke to land. Um, uh, those are technical decisions. They're also design decisions. And then, you know, what the designer might do, I mean, I'm the designer here. I'm just sitting here putting this thing together. But, you know, the designer might say, okay, we're going to have a picture of Ryan Gosling instead of just nothing there. And we're going to, you know, float the text to the right, and it's going to be this font and this and that. But all of the design decisions that people are making here um, are also, also result in development decisions as well. Uh, for example, um, uh, in the actual code for this, um, I ask for um, a word that is, uh, I also limit the length of the word that I'm getting back. And that was just to make sure that the um, alignment of the text um, worked uh, on mobile and other places. I just limited it to shorter words. Um, and then, so that's design, that's development. But what's this? What's this decision to say, oh, let's add a picture of Ryan Gosling to some words that we've chosen from a dictionary API call, right? Like what, that's the sort of core of this project. But is that a, is that development? Is that design? I mean, it's got elements of both. Is it neither? Um, I, I just thought about this a lot because it really um, uh, got me thinking about about the line between these two things. Um, because we're on opposite sides of a mirror, um, I like to give opposite types of advice to each kind of person on a team. Uh, for me, working on a team with developers and designers, where everyone's an equal creative collaborator, uh, collaborator and this is important, I really want these people to be equal creative collaborators, um, is about meeting in the middle between the disciplines. Um, so, I often give creative advice to developers. Um, for example, uh, one of the things that I like to drive home to people uh, who are doing creative work is that it's important to embrace mistakes. Uh, developers are often taught in school and even on the job that bugs are not desirable. You don't want bugs, right? You want to be given a spec, you want to make the thing happen, everyone's happy, and you go home. And that can be good for a project where, as a developer, you're not a creative, sort of an equal creative partner in something. But if the developer is supposed to be creative, I think it's really important to embrace the mistakes. Um, I'm going to show you a, um, a project I did. Uh, this is a game that we did at Field Train for um, Stephen Colbert. It's called Bubble Burst Bernie, and it's a, kind of a funny political poking fun at politics type game. Um, we have more people in jail today than any other country on earth. Uh, the Cold War is over. You know, You're going to see a lot of delegates. He likes to move his hands around when he talks, and so they thought it would be fun to do. We are spending hundreds of billions of dollars maintaining 5,000 nuclear weapons. Uh, here we go. So that's... Oops. Oh, there we go. So that, you notice his hand is going crazy all around there. Um, that wasn't in the original design for the game. Uh, that was actually a bug in the physics engine that I, uh, that I came across, and I thought, oh, that's actually kind of fun. It looks like a weird, and I ran it by the designers, thought I was
was working with and they said yeah that's pretty cool let's 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 keep that in let's make it a power up and so then they went and they made that feel the burn marquee um and uh, and the game was more interesting was the worst uh, foreign policy um, blunder in the modern history of america it, so like the fact that he keeps talking even when he goes back behind the podium that's a bug he wasn't supposed to do that but that was actually funny so we left it in uh, and then the fact that his arm just keeps doing this, uh, that wasn't planned either. That was, I just forgot to put an if statement around it and, uh, and it was hilarious. And so we kept it in. Now you have something to do while you're, you know, looking at your score. Um, so, uh, you know, I, bugs can sometimes be good. Actually, one of the reasons why I love JavaScript as a language is because if you make a if you make a mistake in uh, in C++, uh, for example, the compiler just you know breaks and just says, "Well, you made a mistake. You, you made a type error here. You can't cast this to that." Uh, JavaScript is great because it just keeps plugging along. <laughs> it just it'll ruin your day. But uh, but I actually kind of like that. Uh, uh, sometimes it just it just surprises me, and it feels a little bit more like I'm collaborating with the computer than uh, uh, and and the computer is this sort of like ornery partner who I have to you know uh, 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 you know oh that I guess that's a good idea. I guess we can we can roll with that. Um, Related to that is, uh, I think it's important to, for developers when you're doing creative work to listen to your code. Uh, this is actually advice that I got from a painter I know. Um, she's a, a painter and a coder. Um, and uh, what she was telling me about painting and other sort of more traditional creative media is that uh, they really talk about listening to your materials. Um, if you're, if you're uh, creating some pottery, and the clay doesn't want to move in a particular direction. Maybe it's the, the ambient temperature in the room or the quality of the, of the clay that you're working with. Um, you work around that. You work those things into your piece rather than trying stubbornly to get the thing to do what you want. And it probably, the, the pot you're making will break or something like that. Um, I think you can listen to code as well. Uh, APIs, libraries, and languages have affordances just like paint, clay, and stone. Uh, if you're trying to do something in the API and the programming language, uh, don't seem to want to let you do it, do something else. Work around it. Don't do the thing. Just roll with it. Um, when, when you approach a project as a developer, like, okay, I got a spec, I implemented it, I'm done, I'm moving on, um, that's a valid way to work, but that's not a creative way uh, to work. And, uh, and so if you're going to be an equal creative partner with design. Uh, you need to uh, move uh, beyond that. And these are just two things that I always try to keep in mind when I'm doing um, creative development work. Uh, for designers, I like to give systems advice because developers are always systems. Um, I think it's important to remember that there are really, uh, uh, there are a ton of systems that underlie your designs. Uh, Sarah Drasner spoke yesterday about the hue, saturation, brightness, color space. Um, that's, a, that's a very technical... Uh, if you understand color theory and you can map that to the mathematical HSB model, then you can provide better technical information to a developer that allows both of you to be more creative. Uh, instead of saying, make this button this color on a click, you can say decrease the saturation and brightness of all buttons by 30% on click. And now your designer is free to work with all sorts of different colors. You could play with different hues. Um, uh, and it's just a more flexible system than just handing um, a, 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 a completely solid spec set in stone uh, to a developer. Suddenly, the developer has a rule that can be applied across all other things. And now that there's a rule, they can say, oh, well, what if we apply this to other UX situations as well? Um, the other thing I want to talk about is parameterization. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is um, open up a little demo here. Um, so this is a rectangle. You might be familiar with rectangles. Um, it's actually animating right now. We have a frame counter up in the upper left. It's not doing anything at this moment. I'm going to actually pull open the console here and blow that up. Um, so our rectangle has four basic parameters. The x-coordinate, the 
the y coordinate, the width, and the height. Pretty simple. Um, I think it's important when you're a designer to, to understand that these parameters can be mapped to different values and, um, uh, and to actually go through every characteristic of what you're building. You might have an idea in your head of, oh, I want a red rectangle, and it's going to be in this position. Uh, but especially during the design and prototype phase, the early phases of the project, it can be really helpful to go through all your different elements and actually just make a list of parameters and work with a developer to build something like I'm showing you here, uh, what, I, what I actually, right now it's doing, uh, it, every frame it's running a transform, which in this case is a, is a no-op, and I'm just going to overwrite it with this. Uh, the Y position is going to be uh, mapped to a sinusoid function based on the frame count. Um, so, okay, so now it's bouncing up and down. Like, that might not, it might not have been, you know, if you think about a red rectangle, I think that it can bounce up and down, but it can. Uh, we could do something, instead of having it bounce up and down, we could map it to the Y, uh, excuse me, the X position. So now it's bouncing, but it's bound to my mouse instead of um, uh, time. Uh, and then you can mix and match different things uh, as well. Um, and this is where I just find it really fun to play with what these different properties can do. You know, I'm just making things up. Like, oh, what if I sinusoid to uh, math.random instead? What if I put a tangent in there? What if I threw, you know, something else? Uh, this is just a part where you're, the, the designer and the developer are playing with these parameters. Um, what this does during the exploration and prototyping phase of a project um, is you can push these parameters to their limits. Uh, you can understand what happens at different extremes of your design. Uh, and by playing with numbers, you and the whole team can get a better understanding of the limits and the overall shape of your design. And you might even find that there are options available to you in your design that you didn't even know were there to begin with. Uh, this also lets developers have a direct hand in the design phase of the project. And everyone can contribute to the core design using their own subject matter expertise. All right, let's go back here. When we think about designers and developers, we often imagine them as fundamentally different kinds of people. Oh, designers are visual and developers like math, but those are lazy stereotypes. And actually, most developers don't like math. Um, uh, and they mask the fact that we're all just really trying to do our best creative work together as a team. Uh, at Field Train, we don't believe that design and development are different roles. Everyone's just a worker owner at Field Train. We're just all on the same team trying to get things done. A designer, someone who might consider themselves a designer, can pair program with a developer. A developer can whiteboard with a designer. We often try to get work done at most companies, most studios, by splitting up tasks. My work is a development, your work is the design. And we'll check in with each other every couple days, and hopefully our work converges, and we do a big, messy git merge, and then everyone tears out their hair for a little bit. Uh, um, this is, of course, sometimes necessary. Um, but you know, we're all just people trying to get done. Uh, and I think we do our best work when we do our work together, not in, not in parallel, but alongside each other. We talk a lot about um, tight iterative cycles between designers and developers. But what if there were no designers and developers? What if it was just everybody was trying to get things done? Um, in a sense, nobody is a designer and nobody is a developer because we're all just people trying to solve problems. And in another sense, Everyone is a designer and everyone is a developer because we're all interdependent on each other. Um, and I just want to, you know, I hope you leave this talk uh, keeping this in mind uh, for your future projects that uh, maybe, try, maybe try getting work done uh, like this uh, instead of like this. Um, and that's, that's, that's all I have. I'm actually uh, uh, really happy to take some questions uh, now. So thanks for listening. <laughs>